The following podcast contains alcohol-enhanced conversations about alcohol, as well as the potential for the discussion about topics of dubious, disturbing, possibly offensive, but usually hilarious interest. The opinions stated herein are solely of the persons making them, and any endorsement of these opinions by any other party is not implied. Foul language is likely, but intolerant viewpoints are not. Listener intoxication is advised. Hello and welcome to episode 30 of the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. I'm Ed. And do we have a special cocktail episode for you today? Oh yeah. <laughs> As teased previously, we're doing a buzzwordy deep dive on two cocktails that we previously featured on this podcast, as well as a third classic that we've talked about but never actually tasted, mm. one that we feel represents a step up for the average whiskey cocktail drinker. And joining us down here in the nerdy cocktail depths are two veterans of our cocktail episodes, and indeed veterans of not only creating cocktails, but also drinking them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gabe the Whiskey Sherpa. Yo, yo. And master mixologist and bartender extraordinaire Anders. Hey there. <laughs> but of course, before we get into all the creating and the drinking, Ed's here to tell us the three Three names of the three cocktails that our four tongues will be diving deeply into today. <laughs> yes, Scott. Thank you so much. <laughs> really excited. We're going to have three cocktails coming up. Like Scott said, two of them that we featured before, but we're going to do a deeper dive into them. One is the Manhattan, which mm. has a lot of different ways to go with it. And we're very excited to see what Anders is going to bring us. Uh, the next one we're going to do is one that we dived into, but really, really like, you know, you shouldn't dive into three feet of water. You break your neck. That's kind of <laughs> what we did with it. We dove in, made a mint julep, and it mm. was terrible. So we've brought some help. We brought a professional to mm. help us make a real mint julep with a Kentucky Derby just in the rearview mirror. We figured it'd be a perfect time to talk about the mint julep so we could help our fans get it right because we certainly didn't do that a year ago. We did not. And the third cocktail, mm. no, one that has a mystique to it yes. that goes mm. back to the days of Vincent Van Gogh, <laughs> and that would be the Sazerac. Mm. And even though Scott's been in New Orleans, he's never had a Sazerac, I which is a it violation. A, it was a huge failure, in, in my, my opinion. I, I, I admit, I've never been it. in New Orleans, so I didn't fail like that. <laughs> I've never had okay. a Sazerac wow. in New Orleans. Oh. Were you in New Orleans? Yeah. Well, you failed to that. <laughs> uh, I've never been to New Orleans. Fail. We've all failed. <laughs> And you have your own truck. You drive every day. You could just drive right to New Orleans tomorrow if you wanted. You're actually going to be in a truck. You're going to drive for eight hours. That'll get you like a third of the way there. We're in New Jersey. It's somewhere south of us. Yeah, it's right around the corner from here. <laughs> so the Sazerac, the mint julep. But we're going to start first with Anders telling us, what are we doing with the Manhattan? Manhattan is a drink that goes back all the way to the like late 1800s. Babylonians, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah, that's where the name comes from. It's <laughs> right. It's, uh, Babylonians. They Manhattan's found a- it in cuneiform on uh, right. Manhattan's the a Rosetta translated Stone. Right. It's, yeah. it's, tra- it's translated from- Rosetta Stone. <laughs> Traded like the Rosetta Stone for like three marbles or something like that, and that's how they got the island from the Egyptians. Anyway, um, <laughs> the Manhattan is considered one of the six main cocktails. Old fashioned Manhattan, Daiquiri, Martini, Collins, and uh, milkshake. Uh, sure, the milkshake picked all the boys in the yard. Damn yeah, right. like it's They're better than your damn, damn right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so this recipe uh, is, is from William Schmidt from 1891 uh, wow. from the Flowing Bowl. So it's over 100 years old, this recipe for Manhattan. And it's going to have your usual components. It's going to be whiskey and bitters and vermouth in there. We have uh, bullet rye in, in this Manhattan, but there's also going to be a little bit of absinthe. Ooh. There's a dash oh. of absinthe in there. I guess. Yeah. Mysterious. Nice. Start the party. Yeah. <laughs> and there is a small amount of simple syrup. Uh, oh, the wow. recipe traditionally calls for gum syrup, which is simple syrup syrup that has acacia gum or uh, gum arabic which adds a little bit of body to the cocktail so we're gonna just pretend right and which vermouth 
Does that matter? Yeah, actually, I used an Italian vermouth. When you look at like uh, the Savoy cocktail book, which is an old kind of standard for cocktail books, yeah, they usually it's either Italian or French vermouth. So Italians really have the lock on sweet vermouths. I went with Cocchi Torino. It's okay. a little bit sweeter, but there's like some other kind cool. of. All right, let's taste it. Notes. Yeah. Round one. Ah, 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 yeah. Ah. One. They're being served in lovely mm. four ounce mini like looking martini glasses in a way, but not that doesn't do it justice. They're coupe glasses. Yeah. Coupe. All right. So I don't think coupe. the public will know what that is. But. No. Uh, so think oh. of a rounded martini glass. It's actually a champagne glass, but not the flute. They use these in champagnes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they're, a little bit, they're, but they're, six ounce ones, not four. This is a four ounce. Yeah. Version. They're small. So fun fact, these glasses are actually uh, modeled after Marie Antoinette's breast, apparently. Oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wow, that's a delicious. Let them make cake. I tell you, when you mm. taste something that's crafted like Andres did with this, you realize how shitty our cocktails are that we make in our kitchen. <laughs> like, like I mean, I just throw vermouth and bitters at the glass and just hope it fucking is it goes down. Okay. I mean, that's what I do on my twelfth one. <laughs> I mean, this is so good, and you can taste all the different flavors in it. Just a hint wow. of the anise yep. from yeah. the absinthe, absolutely. And you just want to sip it. Yep. You, you don't want to gulp this drink like oh. we do our Manhattans. Yeah, it's. it's it's different than your uh, normal take on a Manhattan. It's got a bit of a, uh, it's almost like a leathery, uh, complex, uh, gimp mask type uh, <laughs> flavor. That's got to be all the absinthe, uh, right? Yeah, it's, it's, the yeah. absinthe really is bringing it to a whole other level. It's, it's deep. <laughs> I have to tell you, it's yeah. one of the best drinks I've ever had. It's so, so good. good. It's really good, right? It's really it's, good. It's so good. If the absinthe wasn't there, the absence of the absence, <laughs> this would be way too sweet. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But with the absence in there, mm-hmm. it balances out. It has such a round mm-hmm. quality to it. Yeah. It's so, I want to say savory, but like, it, yeah. Yeah, like so Gabe, it, it, I'm it's, struggling it's, it's with hard, the word. It's hard to put your, your description in yeah. it. Um, so right. uh, a lot of what these classic cocktails really focus on is just creating contrast between like the alkaline of like the bitters mm. and yeah. the sweetness of the vermouth. So when you add the extra sugar from the simple or the gum syrup, whichever you're using, um, the absinthe, which is a little bit more alkaline, you want to have those extra contrasts so they kind of play off of each yeah. other mm. while bringing out some of the other notes of the uh, the whiskey. Right. Yeah, right. It, uh, it almost has uh, a marmalade taste to it of like yeah. uh, orange peel mm-hmm. with an undertone at the end of it. Yeah. So what bitters did you use in this? Uh, I used Angostura. The um, regular Angostura? Uh, regular okay. Angostura bitters. I think the original recipe calls for Boker's bitters, but I just Boker's, didn't have yeah. them either. There, so yeah um so uh, to follow the theme of the deep dive we did mention this cocktail and its history yeah. and it's also other variations on episode five which was gabe's first episode yeah um i went a little deeper and i found the most credible origin story from an essay by william h mulhall that was included in a collection called valentine's manual of old new york published in 1923 mulhall was a bartender who worked at the hoffman house on 25th and broadway in the 1880s and he wrote that quote the manhattan cocktail was invented by a man named black who kept a place mm. 10 doors down below Houston Street on Broadway in the 60s. Uh, this is the 1860s, of course. Um, unfortunately, the identity of the man named Black has been lost to history. But based on this account, there are apparently two different places that served drinks in the 1860s that could have been the location that Mulhall described. First is Stanwick's Hall, which is where the famous shooting of the gangster William the Butcher Poole, leader of the Bowery Boys, who was the inspiration for the character that Daniel yes. Day-Lewis played in Gangs of New York, mm. and the Metropolitan Hotel, who employed the bartender Jerry Thomas, a.k.a. the professor, who invented the Tom and Jerry cocktail and published the first book about mixed drinks in America. Oh. So it's... Either of those could be plausible of where yeah. this guy Black worked and served the first Manhattan cocktail. And that that's it. You can't go any deeper than that. That's, <laughs> yeah, I'd lean towards the hotel because he wrote a book there and I feel right. like that's why it would have been publicized. It makes sense. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Um, So I think there's also, I've, I've seen that there's evidence going that it was a cocktail that people were making, but it wasn't called a Manhattan until around right. the mid to late 1800s. That is also true. And it's interesting that you mentioned Jerry Thomas because he was really like the first celebrity bartender, which Mm -hmm. I, in my opinion, celebrity bartenders are just white dudes who want to get laid. Unless you're Isaac from The Love Boat. He did get laid. Uh, that's right. Let's be real. He just wasn't white. It was the love boat. <laughs> Otis would have got a lot of action on the love boat. Oh, I'm just saying. I wish I could travel back in time. Seriously. And love boat. He would have yeah. banged Chachi. Chachi? <laughs> Chachi? Coochie, coochie. Oh, Charo. Charo. Oh, what's Chachi? Chachi. Oh, Charo. <laughs> 
that's even Scott I'm like Bale. Chachi? No, that's Scott Bale. I'm sorry. I, from I, the think, love uh, I think Joni would have had a problem. Joni loves that. Chachi. <laughs> I don't think so. Damn there, it, Isaac! Get away from my man! This is too funny to cut. <laughs> Shit! <laughs> yeah, it's not Chachi Charo. Chachi, <laughs> Chachi. No, Chachi not Chachi Charo. I mean, yeah. you know, they're right, right. Very yeah, close. You yeah. know, you fucked up when Charo. I'm like thinking like that's not. <laughs> no, I was wondering why. He's, no, like Andre's face had a weird look, and I'm like, what? Like he was like wincing. I'm like, no, she was. She was kind of hot for the day. Yeah. But like, no, Chachi wasn't. Charo, Charo was. was. Yeah. And a churro just to cinnamon goodness. No, oh, yeah. Churro. <laughs> I do love me a good churro. I'd bang a churro. So, okay. Honor, so I have... Uh, <laughs> Are you actually coming out of this? Yeah, I'm coming like, out of this. All right. All right. So, uh, so honors, I have five things about the Manhattan that I wanted to ask you. Okay, yeah. So, about the proportions. Ooh, so this the, is a fun one. So, the modern proportions mm-hmm. um, of the three ingredients, the whiskey, the vermouth, and the bitters that make up the modern Manhattan, not what we're drinking right now, yes. it's two to one and just a dash of bitters. Mm. So, what do you think of those proportions? Because everybody knows that I, my proportions are way different than this. So, firstly, I disagree with those proportions on the fundamental level because mm-hmm. One of the barisms for making Manhattans is it's 212, which is also the right. area code for Manhattan. Right. So two parts whiskey, one part vermouth, and two dashes. Yes. What's more is depending on what whiskey you're using, I'll usually reduce the vermouth. What about the whiskey makes you do that? Uh, I prefer a higher proof bourbon. Mm-hmm. And then using less vermouth, like, so a, like I, an old Ezra. Yeah, I, it's, it's probably the most cost-effective one. Or yeah. even an old Granddad One Fourteen would be. Uh, yeah, reasonable. OGD. Um, if you want to get a little bit fancier, you could do uh, Knob Creek Single Barrel. And I am a big fan of the Booker's. Ooh. Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, I had to make me one of those once. Yeah, it was a well-spent twenty-four dollars, whatever <laughs> it was, for the head, but They're it was so it was very good. So I like eight to one, which is way low vermouth yeah, I've, yeah. I've come up to six to one okay so, it's kind of where i live yeah and i gave just signaled to me four to one is that your favorite game i thought that was yours but oh um, yeah mine's eight, I'm, I'm probably more one. of a three to one. Oh, three to one okay. yeah yeah again sometimes the I, honestly is, it's just too sweet when yeah. you do two to one I, yeah three yeah, to yeah one i think even. you're right i think i do three ounces of whiskey and an ounce of vermouth yeah. Yeah. i mean you're gonna there get some go. sweetness That's off the regular right. yeah, absolutely. Uh, bourbon anyway so yeah. it, it just it's almost a bit too sugary and it's funny you mentioned the vermouth on there's like um the third one on my list so we'll just jump to that was sure. about the vermouth and uh, the person writing this article where I, I had gotten this was match your proof to your vermouth but yep, that rhymes and and it says use less vermouth with lower proof whiskeys is what they recommended yeah. which is that isn't that the sense. opposite of what you said uh, right. no i use less vermouth when i'm using bourbon as opposed to rye but oh. they would that would be correct oh like, okay use less vermouth to lower proof so if you're I using see. something around, because of the flavor yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. anders what was the uh, ratio of absinthe in this one uh, just a dash i used an atomizer and just kind of put a spray in but uh if you have a dropper or anything like that you just use one drop or so wow is that absinthe. powerful huh yeah yeah you, you could taste it even though it's yeah small. i just yeah. put a so, spritz in so for people each used one to of drink these. that straight right he just it's drink absence like a cordial almost i mean they didn't they didn't have the internet they were bored yet <laughs> well the absence typically was what you would take the absence and you have a sugar cube mm-hmm. spoon and you would drizzle it over the right there's a whole the process cube, yeah. To, yeah to sweeten it up and then would that be over ice or just straight up um or? so i have an absinthe fountain uh well of course you do what <laughs> who doesn't do we'd be surprised if you didn't yeah actually, I'd, you know. I'd probably be disappointed as well and so would i honestly <laughs> so you would use ice water in the vessel and you would have it drip very slowly over a absinthe spoon which is a slotted spoon they have beautiful designs as well and then you'd put a sugar cube over there and what I would suggest is that you actually take a match and light the sugar cube beforehand so it begins to caramelize and so it's not as granular yeah and you would pour your serving in of absinthe over the spoon and the sugar before lighting it because the absinthe is flammable. It's right. very high proof. And then you let the water kind of drip, dissolve the sugar cube and burn it out. Use the spoon to mix everything together and dissolve the rest of the sugar. And there you have a serving of absinthe. Wow. wow. We want yeah. we have to do an absinthe episode. We have a lot of episodes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the whiskey, um, yeah. bourbon or rye? I pick bourbon, uh, right. but I, I see merit to both. If I'm going to drink one on the rocks, I prefer rye. If I'm going to drink one neat up, I would uh, prefer bourbon. Oh, interesting. Um, and this had rye in it. This had rye. This particular this had one rye. had rye in it. Yeah. The, because the original I, mm-hmm. had rye. rye. Yeah. That's correct. Um, bitters. So Angostura, of course, is what you used, uh, yeah. which is the standard nowadays. But apparently it wasn't always so. Three different cocktail books apparently came out in 1884. 
and one had Angostura, one mm-hmm. had something called Peruvian bitters, and one just said bitters. But Jerry Thomas would later suggest using Boker's. Boker's bitters, yeah. yeah. Do they I, still sell that nowadays? They or is that a, do. Really? I, th- I think they, I don't know, it's on the internet somewhere. You can, uh, you can find all sorts oh, of probably. fun things there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. All right, so that was the deep dive of the original Manhattan recipe from the late 1800s. Mm. And uh, that was delicious. Are we doing another Manhattan or are we switching to the next drink? Let's switch to the next drink. Yeah. Mint julep. Mint julep. All yeah. right. Julep. Be right back. Round two. <laughs> hey, everybody. We're back with Anders' version of the mint julep that we're going to focus on today. And a little fun fact, National Mint Julep Day is May 30th. Um, a mint julep is a drink that goes way back. It's been mentioned in Gone with the Wind, the movie. Mm. It uh, mm. first became the drink of the Kentucky Derby the year before that, back in 1938. Wow. It's sugary, minty, and fresh. really, it's only fitting that it has a national day devoted to it. Scott and I tried to make it last year, and we fucked it up <laughs> so bad. Twice. <laughs> Twice, and uh, gave up. So we brought Andres here, who's going to really put a lot of you on your ear with a completely different take on it, one that has been around for a long time, but is not nearly as popular as a traditional one served at the Kentucky Derby. Wait. So, Anders, take us on the journey of the mint julep. All right. The mint julep, uh, it's a very traditional bourbon drink, famous for uh, being at the Kentucky Derby. But the mint julep did not originate in Kentucky, actually. Uh, had a lot of different permutations going back all the way to the Middle East, but juleps ended up just kind of becoming a term for medicines and tinctures and things like that. So when it came in terms of a cocktail, I think David Wanderick wrote about it, that it would essentially kind of be like a, did you have your julep today? Like kind of waking up and doing a bong rip. Uh, <laughs> that was kind of the implicit nature of what a julep was. Okay. And the mint julep was originally brought over into Virginia in the US and made with rum, okay. which was uh, obviously very popular with maritime culture going from the UK over here. Virginia at the time West Virginia did not exist yet because it was right. pre-Civil War. Right. It was right next to Kentucky. So when the drink kind of became popular and permutated throughout Virginia, it moved over one state to Kentucky. Mm-hmm. They were making bourbon at the time and they started making them with bourbon and then it right. eventually right. became that's associated. What they had. And I could right. jump Derby. here a second. In the 1700s, mint chills were used to treat upset stomachs in Virginia. Um, and then the first time it's been on print was in 1803 in mm-hmm. Washington, D.C. Kentucky Senator Henry Clay yes. was mm. recorded drinking a mint julep at the Round Robin Bar in Washington, D.C. in, in 1803. No, he was allowed to. It was he a got bar. caught. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> I'm just saying they were mentioning he was drinking it. So that's the first time the mint julep appears in print. Right. And he's from Kentucky, which I think is interesting because he probably had a bourbon version, you would think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But right what? now, this version is a rum version. Right. This is a rum which version. Which I've never had. No. So people really kind of mystify and have their own spins on mint juleps, but they actually are really simple. It's basically just an old fashioned with mint. Yeah. Okay. Here I've put in one dash of Angostura bitters just because I enjoy the contrast and I've decided to use a mint simple syrup uh, to get some of that extra peppermint flavor in. So you shouldn't muddle the mint? You're more than welcome to do that. My only caveat is scientifically, the more you work that mint via muddling, you're also going to release a lot of the chlorophylls and then it's going to become a little bit more alkaline. There's merit in enjoying things for tradition, but I like to play around and say fuck tradition every now and then. Which rum did you use? Uh, I use Smith & Cross, which is a traditional Jamaican rum. I'm cool. a big fan. Now, I asked you when you were putting this together, you were, the technique with your mint, it was you were just basically slapping it to open up the oils of the leaves. Absolutely. If you were to take the stems off and just muddle the leaves, would you still get as much bitterness? Or is, um, it, is there like a, a ratio of bitterness compared to the leaves you, and the stem? You would. Part of it would also just the veins inside. Uh, uh-huh. It's the chlorophyll inside the cells of the leaves as well will release it as almost like a defense mechanism to ward off herbivores that would be eating mint when they right eat donate me on poison exactly <laughs> yeah. the mint chulips are traditionally served in silver goblets that allows frost to form on the outside which is what we have which uh-huh. is what <laughs> we have and we actually have frost and um, Anders when he brought them to us he held them very much at the top because he says you know by just holding it a human hand with the oils and the heat will start to take the mm-hmm. frost 
coating off the glass. Yeah. Traditionally, the bartender serving a mint julep is going to wear a set of white gloves. The actual glass will get so cold that the heat won't be as big of an issue, oh. but the oils will create a natural barrier oh, uh, I see. from the frost actually forming. Mm-hmm. And the reason you get that frost is because the ice is crushed. Um, we're using pebble ice courtesy of Sonic. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's your hot tip for the day. Right. Uh, because the ice is so small and has a larger surface area, it's actually going to get colder than the ice normally is. So right. it's going to cool. basically super chill. So it's perfect for a hot day like you when you're watching the Derby. Right. Cool. So yeah. let's uh, let's try let's, it. Let's drink them. Mm. Oh, wow. wow. So different. The rum takes it in a completely different direction. Absolutely. Everything it's, is, I can taste this, the sweetness and the mint, and then there's this rum aftertaste. It went wow. sideways on me because wow, I forgot really? yeah. that yeah. we were drinking like, rum. Oh, right, this isn't whiskey. <laughs> right. This isn't a whiskey Ooh. tangent. Yeah. Wow. Oh, man. I mean, uh, the mint that we traditionally think about when we think about mint is like mint gum or mint, um, right. mint, uh, like, um, mints. <laughs> Yeah, mint mints, but that's not what this is. So this is super herbaceous, yeah, and just a hint of that minty and, I mean, and quality with, to it. And with the popularity of mojitas, it's not an unknown flavor now. No, it, it's not. I, I get like this in my nose when I breathe yeah, out after I've drank it. Yeah, it's like a mm-hmm. menthol. Almost. Yeah, yeah, very very true. This is twice as good as both of our <laughs> fucked up drinks put together. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't even have any whiskey in it. I'm, I'm just intrigued now to see what the uh, the bourbon version would taste like. <laughs> Because wow. I think rum just uh it's it's not bad, but it's, uh, I don't Gabe, think it's are you asking Anders to make a bourbon version of the I'm, I'm mint julep? Is that what you're asking? I I think that sounds like a fun idea. Oh well let's do it. <laughs> Overtime. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So okay. We're, we're gonna make a uh, we're gonna make a whiskey version. Yeah. Round to, to be. be or not to be. That, that is, is the question. question. That is the question. Okay, so we've made a, another batch of mint juleps. This one using bourbon or rye? Bourbon. Rye. Bourbon. Rye. Bourbon. Bourbon. Rye. Bourbon. Kentucky. Bourbon. Yep, yep, yep. Right. Yep, yep, yep. 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 Bourbon. Rye. Right. Right. Mint, right. mint, mint, mint. Mint julep. julep. Scotch. So. <laughs> So I found another story that Kentucky Senator Henry Clay actually drank a mint julep in 1850, not 1803, in the exact same bar. So that's 47 years. Wow. Yeah, been there a while. Really sure, yeah. <laughs> he was there for a long time. I wonder if they carted him. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it says uh, just a little fun fact for the Kentucky Derby: they use 7,800 liters of bourbon, <laughs> 2,250 pounds of mint. And here's a day at work for Yonders to make the 120,000 mint juleps that they sell during the Kentucky Derby weekend at mm. Churchill Downs. I would love to just be a service bartender there for like <laughs> one day. Just how have many, the glasses lined up. up, 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 up how up, many up, tips yeah. you'd get? Supposedly, Teddy Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States, was a big fan of mint juleps, as was mm. F. Scott Fitzgerald, which yes. actually mentioned it in his great masterpiece, The Great Gatsby. Ooh. He did. Um, Ernest Hemingway famously smashed a glass of a mint did. julep in a French bar and shouted, doesn't anyone in this godforsaken country know how to make a mint julep. Oh, it's fucking France. Random belligerence. Fucking France edition. Okay, so how did you make this one? Did you make it any different than previous besides putting in bourbon? No. Okay. (laughs) All right, so what bourbon do we use? Uh, We're using the classic Kentucky Straight Bourbon Buffalo Trace. Oh, Buffalo Trace, okay. All right. All right. Wow. Yeah. So, wow, my first real bourbon mint julep. Right away, much sweeter. Mm. Yes. Sweeter, yeah. A lot, it's, it's very refreshing. Sweeter than the rum, weirdly enough. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, the ratios of everything else was the same as the other one with, with, yeah. with bourbon? Yeah. Um, so, uh, two ounces of bourbon, a half ounce of mint simple syrup. Mm-hmm. That's uh, pretty light, wow. but heavier on the mint. And uh, just one dash of Angostura bitters. Okay. I do like wow. this version better. It goes down a little smoother. Mm. It doesn't have quite, I mean, it's not, it doesn't have a kick as the rum did. Well, I mean, to reaffirm what we talked about earlier, a lot of the original recipes called for rum or cognac. And in this country, it was made popular in the South. So it was natural that bourbon would be used. Sure. But a lot of people have the image of it being served on the verandas of plantations. Actually, this was a city dwellers drink in the South. Oh. Mm. So Frankfurt and places like Atlanta, that. Atlanta, Savannah. Yeah, Savannah. Exactly, exactly. Stuff like that. Yeah. So, Juno. So it actually was a... <laughs> right. Topeka. What? It's Alaska. <laughs> Topeka. Okay, no. Topeka. God. Oh, you just set it off. Tornadoes. <laughs> they know where they live. Yeah, I know. They're Tornadoes. They know where they live. 
<laughs> All right, so we've done the mint juleps. We've done two of them now. Yeah. I'm wow. really excited to get to the Sazerac. Let's do it. We're going to take a micro pause. Micro pause. And already, we're back. They're already ready to go. <laughs> it was so quick. We're back. Round three. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're back. And Anders has made us, me, Gabe, and Ed, our first official Sazerac versions. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. First, before we taste it, tell us how you made it. So this Sazerac is made with Sazerac rye, two ounces, along with two dashes of Peychaud's bitters. I used one quarter ounce of simple syrup. Okay. And slow down. Just Slower. A touch. <laughs> More breathy. Hold on. Pull, I'm, I'm pulling oh. a picture of the Sazerac on my phone. Wait a minute. <laughs> now go. I'm at sazerac.porn.com. And for oh, la pie de resistance. <laughs> oh. Used, oh, no. Now he's speaking French. Holy <laughs> shit. I used a rinse of absinthe. Oh. <gasps> you did that first, right? You sprayed the glass first? Yeah. Actually, uh, I used an atomizer in order to get the coverage all over the glass. Uh, traditionally, you would pour up like about a quarter ounce and then just swirl it around to make sure that you got the inside of the glass. It's not to be in the actual drink, mm-hmm. I see. but it coats the glass to kind of give that extra layer of flavor. And it's uh-huh. really fragrant. You can okay. get it straight on the nose. Oh, my God. That's all I smell. Yeah, I feel yeah. Like. It's I, so I, pungent right absolutely now. Absolutely can smell the absinthe. Mm. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wow. So what's in here now? <laughs> Rye. Sugar. Sugar. Okay. Is it use traditional simple syrup? or Yes. Okay. Peychaud's wow. bitters and absence. So it's really kind of like an old fashioned with the absence, right? Kind of. Kind of. Trying to explain it to the public. Like, yeah. But with no citrus. Uh, right. I forwent the citrus. Uh, if using a garnish, I would use a little bit of lemon. Okay. As opposed to an orange peel that I use in an old fashioned. Interesting. Mm. Right, right off the bat, before you even tasting it, you had a, an essence of a good and plenty candies. Absolutely. Which obviously is with the uh, absinthe. This but ta- a, tasting it, it's amazing. It's a great drink. It's, it's a, a great delicious cocktail. drink. Yeah, oh my God. Why are we not just drinking these all the Why do we make these at home? I don't know. I don't we, know. Because we don't have an absinthe we don't have absinth. atomizer. <laughs> well, let's, how hard is that to go to Amazon and get? Get uh, an atomizer. You don't it's even, like you don't even $8 need dollars Come on, Scott. We don't have to do everything right. Get a goddamn atomizer full of absinthe. Let's go. Random belligerence. Edwin Absent Now edition. You can tell I'm drunk that I did not take offense <laughs> at anything that Ed said. I just, I just went off for no reason. It You're sad drunk? <laughs> this is my ninth drink tonight. We've done a lot of stuff. Yeah. You were counting? Well, no. no. Nine thought, was just, I pulled that out of my ass. No, I was thinking the absence was going to be like a very right. contradictory taste against no. the, the bourbon, but it's mm. not. It's very complimentary. It's actually, yeah. just in the finish for me, like it's like I have the whole drink and then absence. So here's a funny thing. I remember on our uh, Prohibition episodes, Ed and I were talking about how they put absinthe in every fucking drink. Right. And now I understand why. Like, yeah. it's kind of good. Yeah it, yeah, it works very well with this drink. Yeah. Especially if you had shittier whiskey to deal with and you were trying to cover up some, right. some flaws. Right. Absinthe is very pungent and strong. I can definitely see it being a mask. And people back then, they knew what absinthe was. Yeah. They liked it. And having it put into a cocktail was not something that's weird. It's kind of weird now. Like, right. people aren't into absinthe. They yeah. don't know what it is. It was outlawed and they're kind of afraid of it. I think that plays into the fact that we probably have a predisposition about the taste of it that would yeah. probably yeah. not it's, work with what we're normally tasting. Yeah. We've gone soft. We don't like anise anymore. Right. right. Yeah, we've gone soft. <laughs> we've gone soft. Yeah. yeah. Uh, every once in a while, you could use a little bit of anise. <laughs> and it works in this one. Ed is just mad at himself because he told me prior to this podcast is if we say anus <laughs> do not let me make another anus joke <laughs> because i did <laughs> two, two episodes many. in a row and i'm like i'm not going to joke about oh my god who doesn't love a little anus on your lips <laughs> <laughs> but we can make a joke out of you not making a joke <laughs> that's right, right? That's right. It's, it's meta right exactly right exactly. This, this is delicious i mean uh, if i, if it, I it's, it's a highlight of the night for me Absolutely. Uh, and the original Manhattan that we did was unique and delicious. Yeah. And I'm so happy we did that. But this, I feel like I'm in a different time period. I feel like I'm in a time machine and I am sitting there with F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway and we're talking about how it looks like they're, you know, we're not going to go to Warren, but yeah, we gotta- it's really cool. So I have a really kind of long history that I want to impart about the Sazerac because it's actually really cool. Mm. And I wouldn't have made it as long as I did if I didn't think it was as cool. So please bear with me. No. <laughs> as alluded to in episode 28 gabe 
Sazerac is not only a whiskey, a company, a cocktail, but it's also a cognac and a coffee house. And we talked a little bit about the history of all five, but focused primarily on the company and the whiskey while skimming over the cocktail because we knew we were highlighting it on this episode. So to take a deeper dive. Sazerac the Cognac came first. Its full name was Sazerac de Forge et Fils. <laughs> it was established in 1782 in Angoulême, France, by a member of the de Forge family. But it was in the late 1830s that Sewell T. Taylor, owner of Merchants Exchange Coffee House on Exchange Alley in New Orleans' French Quarter, began importing it exclusively and using it as the base spirit in a cocktail he named the Sazerac. Taylor sold his company in 1850 to Aaron Bird, who, owing to the cocktail's popularity, renamed it the Sazerac Coffee House. After Thomas H. Handy bought the place in 1869, he moved it to Royal Street and created the Sazerac Company in order to produce and sell bottled Sazerac cocktails. But as to who originally created the cocktail that Taylor began serving in the first place, the story goes like this. A man named Antoine Amadie Peychaud, Hmm. of Peychaud Bitters Interesting. Hmm. a French Creole immigrant from Haiti, Settled in New Orleans in 1795, later established an apothecary close to the coffee house, and then in the late 1830s began mixing a tonic of bitter herbs from an old family recipe with brandy and absinthe into a toddy using egg shaped cups called coquetier, which, after being bastardized by English speakers, became the word cocktail. cocktail. Mm. Unfortunately, that whole creation myth has some holes in it. First of all, as we mentioned in episode five, the first printed definition of the word cocktail was in a Hudson, New York newspaper in 1806. So while it's possible that the word cocktail did derive from the French word coquetier, Peychaud could not have had a hand in coining it. Second, Antoine Peychaud's death certificate states that he died on June 30th, 1883 at the age of 80, which means Same he- Same year that Krakatoa erupted. Oh. Random facts. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, literally <laughs> volcano rain man's here right which means he actually was born in 1803 so his emigration to new orleans could not have happened before he was born in 1795 <laughs> and lastly the first confirmed use of absinthe in the sazerac cocktail didn't happen until 1873 and is attributed to a sazerac bartender named leon lamoth however what does seem indisputable is that Peychaud created some kind of cocktail containing brandy and his own bitters recipe that he ended up serving to his friends after hours at the apothecary, which then Taylor used as the inspiration for his cocktail, substituting Sazerac cognac for the original brandy, and then later, as we mentioned in the Sazerac whiskey episode, it was Handy who replaced the cognac with rye whiskey, but we didn't talk about why. And the reason is because of something known as the Great French Wine Blight an infestation of aphids mm -hmm. that obliterated approximately 40% of French vineyards in the late 1800s, including the source of the grapes used to make the Sazerac cognac, so he couldn't use it anymore. Interestingly, the blight only ended after French grapevines were grafted with aphid-resistant American grape vines, creating a controversy that exists to this day as to which vines produce the better wine because, you know, the fucking French, am I right? Right. right. We but just last year, the Sazerac Company relaunched what? the Sazerac Cognac, what? which means you can now recreate a reasonable facsimile of the original Sazerac cocktail that was first served in the old Sazerac Coffee House almost 200 years ago. Wow. That's an amazing story. And uh, whatever the original one tastes like, the one we had today was spectacular. <laughs> and it is a highlight so of a long day good. of drinking. <laughs> Oh boy. Sazerac was the cherry on the top of that cake. Absolutely. And I, and I thank Anders so much mm -hmm. for all the hard. He worked so hard today creating so many cocktails. He did. Yes, and, thank uh, you. Very nice. And I yes. mean, I feel bad for him because like, you know, why? he had a nice little break, but like COVID is ruining our lives. What break are you talking about? I've been working throughout COVID. I know, but, I know, but not doing, I mean, you were doing a lot, but not your art. Right. He's like you sort know, of like sketching in black and white now. He's doing the best he can, but I mean, I want him to be able to serve I mean, us drinks. I, 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 it's actually all about me. I want him to make <laughs> drinks for me. I this want is, to, he just made you four drinks. I know. So I know. 
Yeah. And that you, just reminds me of all one, the drinks I haven't made. All right. I'm, if it I'm makes gonna you get, feel better, give him a $20 bill. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start getting cocky about this. Oh. Uh, one, Please Picasso do. had his line period. This is just oh, my period right. of making cocktails over at the local right now. Right. And he had the laws changed so he could actually deliver cocktails to people's homes. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I love being a bar manager <laughs> slash delivery boy. You, know, you got to do what no, you got to do. We found a way to actually make like old, fa- old fashions yeah. and, and put them in mason jars I mean, and deliver them to people. That's probably the best thing that's come out of COVID. It's fucking brilliant. It's yeah. a brilliant idea. All it right. really yeah. is. Um, not to be ridiculous, but come to the local. Really? Because we're way past that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. Random belligerence. Cocky Anders edition. <laughs> <laughs> Come to the local. We're open four to ten. I don't know nine. Whenever <laughs> nine ish. Um, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, Saturday, Sunday will be open twelve to close. Uh, come there. Buy my old fashioned to go. It is absolutely delicious. Twenty five dollars yeah. for four pours in a mason jar. It it's a will change your life. It is totally worth it. It is the best old fashioned to go. I'll say it. I've heard it from other people. It's a fact. Come get it. You're not going to get a better deal anywhere in America. This is the most cocky I've ever seen Anders. It Anders is the is greatest old fashioned of all time. Anders is usually very like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, oh, sorry, it's I know. It's I can, yeah, I can make stuff. Um, it's the apocalypse. I'm trying to eat. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Hey, so, plug away, man. That's all true. Plug away. So what else did you? You wanted to hype a little bit what you're doing? Did you? Oh, right, uh, okay, you so. wanted to be a brand ambassador. Yeah, why not? Right, so um, yeah, right uh, offer good, that good people up. over at the Sazerac Company in Buffalo Trace. I would love to be your brand ambassador. I'm really good at my job, and I love your product, and I would love to rep the shit out of you. You absolutely cannot do better. Find me on LinkedIn. Anders. He is a genius in this time. Mm. All right. So each of these was a, a deep dive on the drinks that are kind of traditional. And by the way, you probably could order an atomizer on Amazon, which Scott's going to do so we can have absinthe. We could just buy absinthe and put it in the glass. Atomize. That's, that's what Anders uses. <laughs> okay. So, well, then we'll do it, Anders. All right. That's what we'll, I want. But okay. we're not right. professionals. Right. So <laughs> for the Whiskey Tangent Podcast, thanks so much for listening. I'm Ed. I'm Scott. With... Anders and Gabe. And yeah, make drinks, enjoy life. And if you're from Sazerac or Buffalo Trace, hire Anders to be your brand ambassador. You'll <laughs> you'll never ever ever be disappointed. Cheers. Later. Bye bye. Cheers, everyone. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, be sure to check out our next episode, which is way better than this one. Oh, yeah. Also, follow and like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Whiskey Tangent. And follow us on Twitter at Whiskey Tangent. You can follow me personally at That Whiskey Guy. And follow Scott at Giant Cup of Awesome, spelled A-W-S-U-M, just to be annoying. Hey! You can email us any questions, comments, or love at whiskeytangent at gmail.com. And of course, you can find us always at our podcast website, whiskeytangent.podbean.com.